now streaming live. I will start the music and let everybody in from the waiting room. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our VBC, The Scuttlebutt. I almost said happy hour. This used to be called The Happy Hour. It's now called The Scuttlebutt, and we get together every Monday and have conversations about all things military, all things related to the veterans community, and tonight we're talking about military records research, how to do it, where to do it, what to look for, um, with military records researcher, a true expert, and a wonderful person, Beth Ruschel. Hello, Beth. How are you? Hi, hey, everybody. I'm good. I'm good. We're going to get into the conversation. I We conceived it. Beth and I are thinking about this as kind of military records research 101 for people who want to get started. And but, you know, Beth immediately goes into the into the detail. So I think we'll be covering a lot of ground and we want to make sure that we have time for everybody's questions and uh, comments. And I know that about 15 or 20 of you have sent Beth queries in advance of this program. I also know about 15 or 20 of you have purchased raffle tickets so that Beth, you you can be included, your subjects can be included in Beth's um, next uh, um, research trip to the National uh, Personnel Records Center in St. Louis. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna spin, spin the wheel of names. We're gonna entertain your questions. And uh, and and we're going to start with with Beth presenting, just kind of how to get started, the how to, where to go, what to, what to look for first. Uh, so I, you could tell that I am flying solo here without Sean. So you will be patient with me if I, you know, don't follow up on the. Oh, here we go. We got a hand raised already. Al Smith. <laughs> here we go. Hello, Al. Al, you have a hand raised. You could unmute if you want to ask a question, make a comment. Oh, I thought it was unmuted. Okay. Before we Beth even starts with the presentation, I'm going to give uh, her a testimonial because <laughs> I sent in, uh, when, when you put out the invitation, it said, if you're looking for a family member, whatever. And I, I emailed Beth and I said, you know, there was a guy who was in Fort Lewis for two months and I, two second lieutenants before we went to Vietnam, got became very friendly with him. He went off to the 25th Infantry Division. I went off to the 1st Infantry Division. And I always wondered, whatever happened to him? Hopefully he came home. So I all I did was give Beth his name and the 25th Infantry Division. And a couple of days later, I get this email from Beth saying, I think I have your guy. And she did. And she had a picture of him. She had his wedding invitation and uh, other information. So I was very impressed. That's Beth. I mean, Thank you, Al. <laughs> yeah, Beth, you are, and I, and I will, you know, I'll say this, that, that I've been working in the veterans community now for 16 years. And so because I do so, people think that I know answers to questions like, how do I get a veteran's ID? Uh, how do I get veterans benefits? Where where do I get my uh, military beret repaired? I got that one once. Um, and I don't know the answer to any of these. And the question I get most of all is, how do I research a veteran in my family? And you know, I know the very, very basics, but not much more than that. And that's why I'm so grateful for people like Beth. Beth is absolutely the number one go-to person uh, for most queries that I get, and certainly for anything that has to do with military records research. And what's special about Beth is that she she does all this uh, out of her passion for it, her um, you know her expertise, her she she contributes to the veterans community as much as anybody I know, uh, certainly here in Western Pennsylvania. And um, unlike me, she doesn't, you know, care about the limelight. She doesn't, you know, have to be, you know, in the spotlight. Uh, she does it kind of quietly, but I've seen it over the years that Beth has done so much for so many veterans. 
very quietly. And, but truly, I think the most valuable thing she probably does is this remarkable uh, records research that she's able to do. So we're going to get to that all, and we'll get to Beth uh, shortly. Uh, but I do want to let people know that we have our first breakfast of the year coming up. And that'll be on Wednesday, April 3rd, if you're in the Western Pennsylvania area and you want to join us. It's always a wonderful crowd. We get about 100 and probably so you would get between 100 and 200 people there normally. I'm guessing this one will probably have 120 people there. This is at Seven Oaks Country Club in Beaver. It's a wonderful community of veterans there. We'll have stories to share. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll have a junior ROTC also from nearby coming and um, we'll be talking to the kids about their experiences with Junior ROTC. So join us if you can. Let us know you're coming. Send me an email. Give us a call. You can go to our website, veteransbreakfastclub.org, and make the reservation. We also have our Greatest Generation Live program coming up, our Masters of the Air program coming up on Thursday, April 4th, this upcoming Thursday. And we have Glenn Flickinger, our host of Greatest Generation Live. Hello, Glenn. Tell us about the program on Thursday. Hello, Todd. Yeah, that we, as you know, we we did not have a program last Thursday, the first break we've had in three months or so. So I'm anxious to get back to work. Uh, Les Shrink is the name of our guest that we'll be interviewing. Uh, 99 years old, lives up in Minnesota. Uh, talks like he's 49 years old, very sharp. Uh, not only a turret gunner, but also shot down and was a POW, uh, shot down over Denmark, believe it or not, and a POW till the end of the war. And it sort of continues, I think, the thought we had in the program before, which was how to defend a uh, B-17 and how to shoot one down. And Les obviously has firsthand experience. Here's the interesting thing about Les Schrenk that I really uh, changed my uh, view of Paul turret gunners. He's five foot eleven. Huh. Yeah, I, I, how in the world did you fit in that thing? I thought all these guys were five four and five five, and he said, "Yeah, it was pretty uncomfortable." So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it should be pretty interesting. Look forward to it. How many programs have we done on Masters of the Air so far this year? Funny you should ask that. So we, this will be our twelfth program. Wow! Wow! Well, yeah, since Don Miller in December of last year, and then since January 15th with Chloe, this will be our 12th program. So, and, and you know, I'm sorry, Glenn, what are you going to yeah, say? Probably, you know, six or so more to go. Yeah. And, and I think what, you know, the, the reviews of Masters of the Air, the, the series is that it's, you know, overall excellent. And, um, but, you know, everybody focus on, focuses on what was left out inevitably in only nine hours how much can you cover and i think that's one of the reasons why we have continued to have this conversation is because there's a lot to talk about around the masters of the air episodes as well as in the episodes right. um and we'll continue to do that and, and i jumped on this when i ran across less through the good offices of don Patton up up in minnesota who i talked to today todd on the phone and gave me a call he's not on tonight he's got some something else in that, uh, obviously, as a as a ball turret gunner, he was an enlisted man. He was a sergeant. And we've talked about this before, where it seems like most of the um, retelling, most of the stories of the 8th Air Force, of the Air War in general, come from the officers rather than the enlisted men. So really happy to find an enlisted man with this uh, POW experience, too, because that's there's something unique about that story for him as well. So that's coming up on Thursday, April 4th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And Glenn, you are also leading this uh, tour of Masters of the Air tour of English air bases from World War II uh, that we're going on for eight days in September. And we're happy to announce the royal family is going to greet us as we come <laughs> off the plane. Um, oh, that's not right. Oh, sorry. I got that mixed up. I'm sorry. Sorry. A couple of beggars from, from the airport are going to stop and see us now. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, we're leaving this starting in September. Uh, we we're, we're really need to get more people signed up here through the next uh, four to six weeks. Uh, we added the uh, stop at the Churchill Archives. Not only the Churchill Archives, but the director of the Churchill Archives, Alan Packwood, is going to be giving us that tour. 
And uh, we're going to interview Alan Packwood later this month, April 30th, on a on a month on a uh, morning program because of the time difference with uh, England. So yeah, this 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 I'm real. This is uh, the highlight of my year. <laughs> That's for sure. So if, if people want to find out more about the tour, they can go to our website, veteransbreakfastclub.org slash travel. That's veteransbreakfastclub.org slash travel. Or they could email me, Todd, T-O-D-D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org, and I can send you the link and all the information. So yeah, if you're interested in joining us, we'd love to have you. I, I think we have a lot of interest, and I think we'll the trip uh, will be a go. We're, we're, we're thinking about changing the group air. Yep. Yeah. We've... Originally going to fly out of uh, Newark, which has proven to be very unpopular. So people hate Newark Airport. I mean, hate it. I, they need to do some brand reputation advertising. <laughs> yes. yes, I know, and I, I'm serious. I mean, we that's it's become an obstacle in the trip. People say, like, I'd go on the trip, but I don't want to take fly out of Newark. Oh, gee, man. So, so, so we're, we're rethinking we're, that. Yeah, and close to talking about offering that from Pittsburgh direct yes. to London, which I yes. think everybody's going to like. And and the price is barely any difference. And there's yes. certainly not of significance. Right, right. A hundred dollars difference, not anything substantial. Yeah, nonstop from Pittsburgh would be great for anybody within driving distance of Pittsburgh. So that's the trip, Masters of the Air, September 11th through 19th. Let us know if you're interested in joining us. Ed Cottrell, who is on this Zoom call, will be on a trip. He will be the uh, celebrity on our trip, uh, going back to uh, to England and, and visiting his um, his uh, old fighter group. Uh, then a week from tonight, we're going to have open conversation. It's been a long time since we had open conversation. I hope you'll join us. Let me know if there's something you want to talk about. Some people have already let me know that they would like to talk about elephants in Vietnam. The Manchus, which is a special battalion of the 25th Infantry Division. There's a new documentary coming out about them. And some Manchu veterans will be joining us. And um, and, and we'll be talking about a lot, of, a lot of other stuff. One thing that I think would somebody that I asked somebody if should come on and talk about intergenerational trauma of war. How does how does the war experiences of one generation affect subsequent generations? I, I think there's something to it. So uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of things and anything else that you want to bring to the table, please plan on it. That's a week from tonight, Monday, April 8th. But right now we're going to get to Beth. Beth, finally. Oh, I have to ask you to unmute. This is Beth Ruschel. She is with, uh, she is Ruschel Research. You can find out more about Ruschel Research at ruschelresearch.com and a real expert in military records uh, research. She got her start doing research, I've found, through conversations with Beth um, at age 14. By then, she had already read all of the hardback versions of the Nancy Drew mysteries. And uh, and then she decided to do her own sleuthing to find her birth parents. She's adopted, and she was eager to find her birth parents, which she did. And that put her on the path, I think, to really understanding how records work and the kind of digging that you have to do to find the information that you want. And she has been doing military records research now uh, for several years, and I know several people who've been helped by her. Beth, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad you're willing to join us tonight. Absolutely, thank you, Todd. So the idea is that we could get uh, Beth to maybe give us just an overview how to get started if you have, a say, a parent or a, a brother or sister or um, you know, a grandparent that you a great grandparent, maybe you want to research. Uh, how do you start? And we'll just out start with that. What? Okay, Beth. What are the three main pieces of information you want to have about somebody that you can research to get started? Yeah, to get started. Obviously, their name. Um, and then the other things, other than their name, it can be, it could be what state they entered the service from is always helpful um, because even if you think the name is unusual, there are probably other people with that name out there. Um, uh, birth date, uh, service number. Um, those are the main things that I look for. And, and if somebody just gives me their name and 
where they enlisted into the military from, I can go from there, really. Um, but usually the name, uh, their place of birth helps. Branch of service is huge. Um, those are all things right there that are very helpful to start with. So hometown where they enlisted, do people, pardon my ignorance here, Beth, people normally enlist from their hometowns. They don't travel elsewhere to enlist, correct? Well, this, the, at least the state, the city and state that they live in when they go into the service are going to be attached to their service records. Um, like on my grandfather's separation papers, it says, you know, Chicago, Illinois, um, right. wherever they lived when they entered the service are going to that that city and state are going to be attached to all of the, the records that I start digging into. I should let people know that Beth sent me a really comprehensive how to get started guide in PDF form that I am going to share here on the chat. And either Beth or I could email it to you also if, if upon request. Uh, I highly suggest that people just look at the PDF because it will contain the links and all the details that Beth covers here verbally. Um, I, I love the fact that you suggest that you know one one thing that people should do before they even maybe even consult the you know official records is talk to family members talk to people who might know something even a little clue might get you you know over a hump absolutely when i was researching my grandpa um my mom knew that he was in the air force or army air force then world war 2 um i'm pretty sure that my uncle thought that he was a ball turret gunner. He was actually a tail gunner. Um, and my uncle um, ended up having my grandfather's flight records. So those are the records that have all of the dates, um, the amount of time they were in flight, uh, all, his flight records from his service, which was huge. Um, and I was able to piece that together with with other things to, to know, you know what missions he was on. Um, but if you just ask around, somebody might know something about the person. Yeah. And even, you know, even just knowing that he was in the Air Force helped um, yeah. when I was look, looking for records. And sometimes it's just a little scrap of information. I did some research on my great uncle, and I just remember everybody saying, all he talked about was New Guinea. He just talked about New Guinea. So I knew he was in New Guinea. <laughs> you know, what I mean, I mean, knew, I knew nothing else. But even that little piece of information was helpful. Um, so anything you could find from the family any scrap and certainly any documentation, separation papers, stuff like that. But also I think any kind of verbal information that might you might come across. Right, is valuable. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And if you don't have anything, if you don't have much to go on, like I said, I mean the name and even knowing where they lived when they went into the service, that's huge. You can go with just the name, but it's gonna take a while because, for instance, what you have up there, Raymond E. Schmidt. There are multiple Raymond E. Schmitz. I found another Raymond E. Schmidt that was also killed in action, just like my great uncle. Um, it just takes longer. If you don't have anything but the name, it can be done, I'm sure, but it's just going to take you longer. Right. Create a timeline. That sounds intimidating. Yeah. So, <laughs> so with Ray, what I did was, um, you know, we really had nothing. And, and, you know, when he went into the service, he went in, to the 5th Infantry Division, he was in a, a field artillery battalion, um, but he was moved around so much during his, you know, four years of service that, and he didn't come home. Um, yeah. So what we did was we took all of his letters and made a timeline, and this was suggested to me um, by uh, another researcher to create a timeline. And, and what that does is that helps, that helps with what records you need to look for that helps with placing them historically at different battles and different times. Um, so say I go to the St. Louis National Archives and I wanna look for morning reports for my uncle Ray. It's gonna really help me when, when I'm looking for him in a morning report, instead of just aimlessly looking, you know, day to day to day to day through four years of reports. Um, so if you have the information or you have letters or you have something that you can create a historical timeline with, if your particular veteran, you know, was transferred around like Ray was, it really helps to create a timeline. And you can see it starts with April 1941 and he's in the 46th Field Artillery Battalion at Fort Custer. And you can see he moves around 
And so you, you want to be able to, and this is what writers do, historians do also, is simply just create a timeline uh, so that you have things in order. That will really help. All right, here it is. This is probably, you know, if you if you if you want one document, this is probably the one to get, or maybe the easiest one to get. I wouldn't say easiest. Um, it depends. Um, you know, it depends on if someone in your family has it. We had that because my grandmother had that. Um, but you know, my great uncle Gene. I didn't have it. And when I requested it, the state of Illinois, every state is different. Just put it that way. If you're trying to request something from the state, um, the veterans, from what I learned, most or a lot of times the veterans will file that separation paper with the city or state county that, that they live in. Um, and I tried to get my great uncles from the state of Illinois and I was turned down right away. Um, so I waited for months to get it from the National Archives and what they produced was a half because it's burned. Um, there are some states like Massachusetts that I was able to get separation papers overnight from, like literally overnight. Um, but if you do have access to the uh, record and report of separation, DD-214, uh, whatever it's called, depending on when the, the veteran was in service, that's going to help you tremendously when you're looking for anything else. I mean, there's so much information packed on that on that page right there. <laughs> Beth, if somebody doesn't have a DD-214, and before 1950, they were just called records of separation or something like that, right? DD-214 yeah, yeah. came around like 1950. If somebody doesn't have this, say, in the family or in the home or in an attic or box or whatever, where's the best place to order it to start? Is it the National Archives, archives.gov? I would do that just because of the length of time it's going to take to get it. Um, so just do that right off the bat. But if you then want to, you know, also, like I was saying, look into the whatever your state state's archives are. Look, look for, you know, Pennsylvania State Archives, um, Illinois State Archives. Look at your state archives page. See how they work when it comes to military archives. Um, and there should be something, you know, on your state archival page that that tells you contact this place or contact and 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 also try your states, try your city, try your county, um, just because that is such a valuable, valuable piece of information. Now, you're probably not going to get you can get a World War Two one if you're anybody, um, but other branches like if you haven't if you haven't been out of service for 62 years or more, you can only get that separation or DD-214 at that point, um, if you're the veteran or next of kin. Next of kin. Um, do, let me, and before we move on here, and I, I, Brian, I know that you have your hand up. I'm going to go to your next. These, let's say, let, let's start with Pennsylvania, Allegheny County, where we live. How robust is the Pennsylvania Archives webpage? I mean, is it easy to order a DD-214 from the Pennsylvania Archives, or does it take like a lot of phone calls or mail or what? I haven't got, I haven't even tried in Pennsylvania. Matter of fact, I was on their website last night. Um, and I'd like, I'd like a test case to see if we can, if yeah. we can get them from the state of Pennsylvania. Um, in, in Illinois, they, they referred me to um, a veteran service officer uh, in the county or city uh, where my great uncle lived. Um, and they responded pretty quickly, no, we don't have anything on your uncle, which okay. when I ended up getting his records, I know is not true because it says in his OMPF that a whole bunch of stuff was sent to um, the VA. So they definitely have his stuff. They just didn't want to share it with me. <laughs> okay. Boy, so it can be tough. But every okay. state's hey, different. <laughs> Brian, yeah. Hi, Brian. Brian. How are you? <laughs> How are you doing, Todd? Been a long time since we've seen you. Yeah, it's good to see you. Hi, Todd. Yeah, Irene is here with me. Hi, Irene. Good to see you. This is Irene and Brian. They've been on our trip to uh, to Normandy. They've come to New Orleans with us. They live in Houston, Texas. It's good to see you. No, it's Likewise. good to see you, too. And thank you again for all that you do for the veterans around the country. Thank you. And you have a research question. Yes. Um, my grandfather was in World War I. I know that he was in the artillery. Artillery, excuse me. And... His records were in St. Louis, and of course, that had a big fire. 
And I have tried to get some information on him and it is, I just run up against the wall. Yep. Is there any way possible that I can find out how to get his information? We are, that is number, that's probably the number one question on yep. our, in this talk tonight. Um, when we ask people, if you have a research question, let Beth know, you know, a third of them were about the fire. I keep on running into this fire. They say they don't have the records because they were burned. How do I get around that? Is there a workaround? Yeah, we are We are definitely going to be discussing that tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Hey, uh, Ron, Ronald Sheehan, why don't you unmute if you can? Yeah. Uh, I, Beth, I want to thank you. I got a couple of papers from you about my two of my uncles. Uh, oh yes, hey. I had I had some of that information, but it it does give me a little bit more information. But uh, what is the and uh, I don't know the, what they call the National Research Center sent me a, an information from an uncle. I, I'm pretty certain he was in the Navy, and they said they have no DD two fourteen because he did not serve. Uh, what's up with that? Uh, like one one issue I have with him is I knew him as Uncle Ken, and when we'd go to visit him in New Jersey, everybody there called him Bill. So it's William Ken or Ken William, and I, I tried to search on both names, but uh, is there a way around around that where they say he was not in the Navy? That does so. The National Archives said that he wasn't in the Navy. Well, they can't find the DD two fourteen. Yeah, they, they didn't find the DD two fourteen. They said because he never served. And uh, never served. I don't have enough. I only have one or two family members left that I know of that might know anything. I haven't contacted them yet, but that might be a a way to go. But uh, so if if you. I think I emailed you back last night. Um, if you email me, hit, you know, the little, like his name, um, where he lived, um, I'll see what I can find. Mm -hmm. If he was actually in the Navy, there's no way that they don't. I mean, they definitely have his information because yeah. the Navy and the Marine Corps are the only ones that the records didn't burn. So if he was in the Navy or Marines, they have his records yeah. um, at the where National records. They would be in St. Louis at the National Archives. The fire that Todd was talking about in 1973 that destroyed a large percentage of, of national of personnel records, uh, the Navy had everything in fireproof boxes. Mm -hmm. So the Navy and Marine Corps, I think they had like maybe 500 records destroyed, but 250, 250 out of how many um, mm -hmm. were recovered. So mm -hmm. they lost like nothing. So okay. if he was in the Navy, they definitely have his his information. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will send you some information. Yeah, email me again. Appreciate thank you, Ron. Hey, I'm going to go to Beth, and then we're going to get um, – I'm going to go to Beth Feather, and then we're going to get Beth Ruschel back on track with her talk. How are you doing, Beth Feather? Good to see you. Uh, hey, thanks, uh, Todd. I'm doing well. Um, but since I've done uh, some genealogy and also because I work for uh, – a congressman where I had to do congressional research to assist veterans. I know a few key things here. So to answer the question here locally in Allegheny County, uh, when the most common uh, question that I got was, oh my gosh, we can't find that DD-214 or those separation papers. And um, if the family didn't have them, um, and if that veteran lived in Allegheny County, uh, during World War II or previous, uh, and if they did what they were supposed to, filed those discharge papers with the county when they returned, uh, you will find that in Allegheny County. Guess what department it's in? The real estate department. Oh my God. What? Yeah, really. I mean, I, I was like, because I Seriously? had the privilege of working for Congress at the time, and I had a very... Uh, I called the county and it was very easy to find out, hey, I'm looking for this DD-214. How can you help me? Oh, yeah, we have those. Where are they? In the real estate department. Oh, okay. I wrote that phone number down big time because I never in a million years would have found it. 
Now, the other thing that I have told other friends who are looking for records of veterans, I'll ask them, where did that veteran live? Where did he go back to after he came home? Go to the county, not state, but the county courthouse, and especially Washington, Fayette, you know, Beaver, Butler, all the surrounding ones, and, and ask them there. Recently, a, a friend of mine um, uh, found one in Washington, PA. She says, oh yeah, my, my sister really wants to do this. So I want to ask the question of the group, all you veterans out there, did you come home and file your discharge papers at the county level? There's a reason they do that for you. Because when the family can't find it, guess where it is? It's at the county somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's my- Thank you for that. Question. Thank That's see, and <laughs> that's why military records research can be so darn confusing. Dennis uh, Wojciech, good to see you. We're, I'm going to have you hold on a second a few minutes while we have Beth continue her discussion here of these military records. Um, I'm going to get back. Oh, here it is. Here's the slide. Um, Beth, DD-214 is one thing. The official military personal L file is quite another. This is kind of the holy grail, would you say, of military records. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what a lot of people want to be able to access. And that's the big you know, the fire disaster, um, the, the DD-214 would be a part of the OMPF. Um, there's so much information in an OMPF. A lot of people that requested them even 10 years ago and were turned down, they have come up with, they have designed such new technology and methods of cleaning these burned records. You know, the records were burned but that wasn't the only problem. Then they were then they were affected by mold because of the water that put the fire out. So um, over the years, they've they, you know new technologies come out. They they are cleaning these records up in methods that they used to not be able to. So there is a good chance that your veteran might ha now have a B file, what they they call B file, which is a burn file. Um, and in a B file, it might not you know it's obviously not going to be the entire official military personnel record, but you can still get some good information within what's left. Um, I have found that myself uh, with, with some of my veterans. Um, but yeah, so if, if you were told X amount of years, you know, 10 or more years ago that your file, he probably even five, they've, they've done so much more in the last, you know, recent years with cleaning these records, it's amazing. But the official mil military personnel file is going to have all of your, uh, every everywhere that they moved to. Um, gosh, I was able to, to pull a, a Navy veteran and a Marine Corps veteran this December, I guess it was. Um, and, and their records were beautiful because they were completely intact. <laughs> So um, it, it, it shows all the movement orders, shows the different places where they've been, um, different places where they were in training. Um, my uncles showed, had a whole bunch of different um, medical records in it, times that he was, uh, and anytime that they're injured or that they've gone to the hospital. Um, and I mean, there's even, even with a fire, I think I have probably like 70 pages in my uncle's. I had two burn files from him and and I still have 70 pages, even though some of it burned. So, you know, it, it's amazing what they've been able to do and, and what you can still get out there. Um, but this is going to help you build your veteran story from beginning to end. Now you're going to still want to look for other records that supplement that, you know, okay, what was going on in Guam at that point? particular period of time, you know, the dates that they were there, but this is going to give you the ability to, to really build a picture of their, of their story. And again, these are records that are available to the public, to anybody. If the veteran has been discharged more than 62 years, if they've right. been discharged within the past 62 years, then only the veteran him or herself or the next of kin could order these records. These order right. these records can be ordered through archives.gov. And we could share the link here in the Zoom room, the exact link that you use to order the OMPF records, archives.com, or, or you could do it by mail. Um, if you do it by mail, I understand, and you've pointed this out, I didn't know this, that you have to request it from the St. Louis National Archives, not the National Personnel Records Center, which is also in St. Louis. A little confusing. 
Correct. And I and I did that incorrectly one time and and it took even longer. I mean, it, it takes if you so Same when you go to make now. a request, it takes months to get, you know, even response. Um, but if you send it to the wrong place, it takes even longer. I think it took me like 16 months just to get a response that I sent it to the wrong place. So <laughs> wow. that's, you know, that's the like the, the, you can only learn that lesson the hard way, I would think, is to make that mistake. Don't make that one again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then if for the records, it's 25 bucks. If it's under five pages, of course, you're hoping that it's more than five pages. In that case, flat fee, 70 bucks, and you get the whole file. And it could be 80 pages, right? I mean, these things could be huge. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, let's go. Let me, add, hey, Dennis, why don't you unmute? It's good to see you. Oh, good to see you too. I, I was going to say, I, I got my dad's. Uh, records from uh, St. Louis, and they were in the burn uh, group, so it cost me, you know, the seventy dollars. But everything is here. His immunization records. Uh, I found out that uh, he was a uh, uh, he was wounded at Normandy, which I I didn't. There, there's so many things I didn't know about it. But everything, even his pay records, uh, every every shot he's ever received from the uh, from the army. And uh, it was well worth the this the the seventy dollars that uh, I paid for this because it just uh, it's it's you know I, I also got mine but you know mine was free but they had to uh, restore these and they did a really good job of uh, of of copying you know, some of the stuff I guess they can't but uh, just it was absolutely amazing and uh, I just I, I was so, so happy cool. that I that I that I spent the spent seventy dollars to. Uh, to get it done because I learned so much more about his service uh, and where he was. Uh, it just made me kind of, I mean, got me a good connection to uh, to him. How long ago did you do that? Did you get those records? That was about, let me see, what's the data on this thing? Uh, I can't read the data on it. it. Probably about five years ago. And, and you know, that, that I'm going to mute you here just for a little feedback. Uh, Renee Gefkin here put in the chat, what are some of the reasons a person would want to conduct a search? And I think this is, you know, to to learn about a loved one that you, so many of these veterans come home, they never talk about their service. Your grandfather, um, Beth, I believe, threw away his uniform, never talked about it. You describe it as a black hole in the family history. And very few people knew anything about him or his service. And there's that human curiosity to know you know, about my father, my mother. Um, and, and then are there other reasons why somebody would want to search? Maybe some kind of benefits or some kind of, um, you know, I, I don't know, a membership in a, in, a, in a group or organization or something like that. I'm sure there are other uh, reasons why a next of kin or descendant would want to know. John Kramer, how are you? You could unmute. How are you doing, Todd? Uh, just an interesting story from my standpoint. Years ago, when my mother was in a nursing home, I was looking into veterans benefits for her. Now, the strange thing about it, my father, who was in World War II, was actually in the Merchant Marines. Now, the Merchant Marines weren't considered part of the military for a long time. And so I started with the National uh, Personnel Center, and they actually issued me a DD-214 for him. But for all his records, get this, I was pointed initially to the U.S. Coast Guard National Maritime Center, who I contacted them, and they sent me a folder an inch thick with things about my father, who in turn sent me to the U.S. Department of Transportation, who now maintains even more records on merchant mariners. And they sent me a folder about an inch thick. I have more stuff on my father than I ever knew existed. Mm -hmm. And once I got all that, I started looking into things like on Twitter and find a World War II Merchant Marines Association who pointed me to more things. And I actually have lists of all the ships he were on, all his shipmates and everything. And it's just one thing leads to another, which leads to another. And so if anybody is looking for something Merchant Marine wise, you go through various groups to find it, but it's all there. Thanks, Todd. Oh, is that great? Awesome. That's well, so cool. 
and Beth, I mean, that is like what you preach is never give up, never give up, never give up. Keep on searching, keep on asking. There are probably more avenues that you could go down than you have time to go down, but but keep on going. And and one thing will lead to another and there you, there'll, you'll eventually see the daylight and get to some of the information that you're looking for. Brian. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Um, Dennis was just talking about how he was able to get some um, records that were from the burn. burn file. How long did it take once he requested that? And did they let him know sooner than later that they were retrievable? Great question. Yeah, that is that is a great question. Dennis, how long did it take you to get those records? It took about three months if i if i remember correctly so it was it was actually you know a, a fairly quick turnaround time but they did let me know that the uh, records were uh, in the part of the burned collection and it would take them uh, a while to make the copies and was i willing to uh, spend the the uh, the money to uh, to get them and i said sure so uh, yeah i think it was a if i remember right about three months from the time i requested till the till the time i got them that's the that quickest is, I've ever heard of. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great turnaround. Let, let's talk. I just was a historian because the fire is an important historical event. It's the greatest disaster ever to befall historical records that we know of. I think it's 12 million records or something like that destroyed. It was a fire that burned for six days. Never been a cause identified for the fire. It happened in the summer of 1973. Uh, you know, tons of water was poured on from the roof and then from the ground up on the on the roof. I think it was the sixth floor mainly. This is kind of what a lot of the records look like. And they weren't discarded. They were they were preserved for in the hope that someday there would be a way to retrieve the information on it. I think when the um and, and as you can see, Beth put here this notation that 80% of the of is it 80 percent of the records destroyed were army or 80 percent of the army records were destroyed 80 percent of the army records were destroyed 80 percent of army records between like 1912 and what 1973 destroyed yeah anything that was filed there yeah oh mm -hmm. brutal 75 percent of air force because it was part of the i guess army for so long and but but the navy and marine corps coast guard not damaged for the most part Correct. okay Correct. um what the uh, oh dennis is showing something here here hold on a second that's oh sorry yeah here oh you were gonna dennis is showing i think the uh the copy of the burn of a burn file and then you have a copy here of the burn file yeah. that you access so this is Clearly, uh, that's the DD two fourteen that I waited sixteen months for. the The picture on the right there that's 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 what I got. <laughs> um, that's my uncle's DD two fourteen. That's what was left of it. Um, I was able to. I mean, it's it was very very beneficial to me um, because it shows all the different times that you know he he was overseas. He he was in a photo recon unit, um, and that that helped me match up with records that I got from the Air Force Historical Research Agency that helped me match up where he was at missions uh, specific. But but that's all I got because <laughs> of the fire from him. I got many more pages, but as far as his DD-214 goes, that, that was it. And you mentioned in your PDF, which again, we will share, I'll put into the chat when I have a chance here. Um, you mentioned a wonderful kind of information center, set, uh, information session that the National Archives did about the reconstruction efforts that are being made to recover these burned records. It really is quite remarkable. I mean, millions of records were taken out of the building and put on the front lawn. This is July 1973 in milk crates. And then the concern was, geez, it's so hot and humid in, in St. Louis in July, mold is going to take over these things. And I think they ended up using McDonnell Douglas uh, vacuum chamber that they were doing, that they were using for space flights or something like that, experiments to squeeze the water out of them. And they got hundreds of gallons of water 
from these pieces of paper. And they just kept on doing it, kept on, you know, one round after another, one round after another, and were able to that way save some of these. So uh, it really is a remarkable story of of recovery. Um, so if, if oh, oh, you were going to say here, this is the, uh, the OMPF could have invaluable information, even a burned one. Right. Like I said, and like Dennis said too, I, the amount of information that was in, you know, my family members' burn files, it was monumental. We we knew of my grandpa, uh, you know, like I've told you before, as being a, a tail gunner, uh, but I learned, and nobody in the family knew, that he initially enlisted uh, into the, the cadet pilot training program, and nobody knew that. And he got washed out because he was an inch and a half too short. But it was it was very interesting to learn. And, and there were records that show like the planes that he flew when he was in in the school and uh, the grades that he got. And but nobody in my family ever knew that. Isn't that great? And you could feel like you get to know your grandfather for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if there is no if it can't be recovered, if it's burned beyond recognition, there are still other records that you could access that will have a lot of information. Correct. Yeah. Uh, like. My uncle Raymond, who was killed in action, there is no OMPF. Um, you know, there's the the IDPF, the Individual Deceased Personnel File. But other records that I, I went to the St. Louis, or not, I'm sorry, I went to the College Park, Maryland National Archives to look in the unit histories. Um, there's so many other places that you can look. It, it, hope is not lost. <laughs> These records. These aren't the kind of records, morning reports, unit rosters. These aren't the kind of records that you could just kind of order from the archives.gov website, correct? I mean, you have to go on site to the record centers and spend correct. some time requesting them, correct? Correct. And IDPF, you can request online. Um, and like many other things, they are in the process of being all sent to the St. Louis National Archives. Uh, the last time I looked, I think St. Louis had letters A through L, but the Army still had everything else. Um, so I, I don't know exactly if that's still where they're at with the IDPFs, but they can be ordered. But the rest of that stuff there is all stuff that you would do on um, on site or hiring an independent researcher. And that's it. I was just going to say, okay, so let's say you don't want to drive to St. Louis and be in that hot, muggy weather in the summer. Um, you could send Beth there, for example. I mean, that's exactly what independent researchers do. They they make the research trips. They go to their connections at the National Personal Research Center or Record Center and elsewhere, and they do the research um, for you. And you could hire Beth to do that by going to her website, ruchelresearch.com. That's R-E-U-S-C-H-E-L records. No, shit. <laughs> Ruchelresearch.com. I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, you could see her rates and, and hire her. Well worth, well worth it, boy, if you're looking for it. George Kniss, how are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, how are you, George? Good, good. Getting along good. Uh, two issues on this. I sent a um, a text to Beth earlier this morning about two of my World War I um, great uncles who um, were born and raised in Dravosburg, PA, and uh, they were both uh, German-American immigrants, and they both went off to war against the Germans in World War I, one was killed in the Argonne Forest, and the other one lived and came back and founded the uh, um, the VFW in De Rosebart. So I was, I just threw that at her, and I gave the names uh, of those two great uncles. Uh, I have just marginal information from their gravestones uh, in the cemetery in De Rosebart and a little bit from the VFW that exists there. So um, I was waiting for a response. And then I got I a second question too about myself and my health records with the burn loss in St. Louis. Go ahead. 
I, I was just saying, I didn't see an email from you um, oh. today. Oh, maybe, okay. maybe you texted me or emailed me. No, I sent it to, you know, I did it. I followed the instructions. Oh, okay. oh, got it. Okay. Well, do you know what? I didn't, um, I stopped checking the, uh, the repository for those queries um, this afternoon as I was preparing for the program. So I will go back and I will send that to, to Beth so that okay. she can respond to you. That's on me. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. But now you raised an issue about the St. Louis fire. Mm -hmm. Let me give you my story about that because it's very personal and very upset, upsetting for me. Okay. So I'm in, I'm in Carnegie Mellon about to graduate and um, the VA comes out and says that um, uh, we have further information about other things that have affected Vietnam veterans being exposed to Agent Orange and other chemicals, uh, spraying chemicals in Vietnam, of which I was there. I used to travel on the planes and take pictures with the ranch hand crews. And I was exposed and I had leaching in my scalp and everything uh, after uh, during the war. And then afterwards, it came back again while I'm in college. <laughs> so I go to the VA in downtown Pittsburgh and I report this to them. And they said, uh, well, can you can you show me your records? And I said, you guys have my records. And they said, oh, yeah, it's in a repository and everything. But uh, can you can you prove that you were exposed. And I said, well, I attended, I went to a num numerous um, medical calls at the dispensary at Tonsonu Airport to be treated for it. And it's in my medical records. So they looked it up and they, they immediately came back and said, we have no record of your records. They were lost in the fire in St. Louis. And I said, well, what the hell? And I said, but can you treat me now? Because it's come back. And they said, no, we cannot treat you unless you can prove that you were treated in Vietnam. So I was incensed. Okay. I was totally incensed. And that's when I just, I just caught that attitude against the VA. This is yeah. like 1975 or so. Yeah. And I was so, so upset. Uh, I had a wife, I had a child, I was yeah. going to college, and here's the VA that exposed me to this stuff, and they discovered that I had it, and they discovered, they put it on the list, and they would not treat me because they negligently or whatever lost the records in a fire. Yeah. Okay, so this is good news for me that they've recovered some of the records, but I, I just wanted to tell you my story yeah. and... That's upsetting. Yeah. Thank you, George. Just very upsetting. I I mm. I went to the private medical people of all types. It was treated. It went away. Uh, my daughter was concerned that uh, when when she when she grew up after she was born that she might get yeah. it genetically from me. Right. So that was a concern for a while. That's been cleared up, but. Um, I just wanted to impart that story and say that that St. Louis fire had big implications for a yeah. lot of Vietnam veterans in the air. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry to mute you there, George. Um, that was, uh, thank you for sharing that. I, Bill, before we go to Bill Confer, I want to spin the wheel of names. <laughs> the wheel of names is the wheel of people who bought raffle tickets. You'll recall that when we advertised this program, we also advertised buy a raffle ticket to have a chance to win Beth's research services for a trip to the National Personnel Records Center where, that you're taking, I think next month, is it that you plan to go, Beth? Um, May, yeah. In May. So you'll be going there, heading there to St. Louis in May to do research. And you have offered to do research I asked you how many winners should we have, and you said three. That there's there's room in your research schedule for three additional subjects. So we're going to select three winners from our wheel of 
um, what do I call it? Wheel of names. And let's spin the wheel. And I want to make sure that we have, that we're optimizing for sound because you definitely want to hear the sound. All right. <laughs> okay. Here's the wheel of names. 276 oh, uh, raffle tickets were purchased. 276. So let's, and I, all the names are here on this wheel. Um, so let's spin it. Yeah. Go, Joe Bosha. Excellent. Joe, you are a winner. I don't know if Joe is with us. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, see if Joe is with us. If not, I will let him know. I know I'll see him on Wednesday at our breakfast in Beaver. All right. So I've removed Joe from, uh, Joe bought like, I think 10 tickets. So I removed him from the wheel. I'm going to spin it a second time. Is that okay? Beth, do you approve my spinning it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. Jim McStay, excellent. Jim, I think also bought 10 tickets, so I'll remove his name. So, all right, third and final spin, here we go. Daniel Fisher, excellent. All right, we got our three winners. Um, I will stop sharing and I will contact each of them and put them in contact with you, Beth, so that uh, you could arrange the research that they're going to do, that you're going to do great. on your behalf. All right. Let me ask Bill Comfer. How are you, Bill? How are things in Lidditz, PA? Okay, just uh, great, Todd. Thanks for calling me. Uh, hey, uh, I just wanted to let George know that uh, there is a Agent Orange newsletter out there that the uh, VA uh, sends out to, uh, I, I was told that just almost everybody that was in Vietnam. So uh, it, it depends, I guess some of the VAs are a little more friendly than others, but uh, you need to, he needs to get a copy of that and stay on top of it because they're relating everything to Agent Orange now, all kinds of uh, cancers and, and different things. And, uh, heart attacks. I mean, it's it's crazy, but uh, uh, there's a lot of things that uh, that can be related. If if that does, if you can't get it from your VA, just talk to the veteran service officer or go to the local legion. Uh, I got started through the legion, and they really helped me. And I just wanted to say that when when I got out of the service, why uh, they gave me a microfish file. So that's how how my, uh, my whole uh, uh, personnel file came out uh, was on microfish. And of course, you got to go somewhere where you can read that. Uh, but uh, I, I could probably apply for a paper copy, you know. Uh, I haven't done that. But I mean, when I left, they actually gave me the microfish. They gave you the actual microfish? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, I, stayed, I stayed pretty up on records while I was in the service because uh, uh, they lost some of my records, uh, especially the shot record. You mentioned the shot record there. I, I got my 17 shots twice uh, when I first joined the military because they, they accidentally put my shot record in my finance file instead of my medical file. So when I got to where I needed to show all those shots, why, uh, uh, nobody checked my finance file. They they checked the medical file and it wasn't there. So I couldn't go to Vietnam without them. So I got 17 more shots uh, before I left uh, for Vietnam. And then last but not least, the uh, Merchant Marines. Uh, Bill Balabanow has been, been going a, a lot down to uh, um, uh, New Orleans. And he, there's some sort of a, there's a museum down there and uh He's uh, putting a lot of Merchant Marine information down there. And uh, I know that uh, 
they're very thankful for having him come down there to to uh, see him. Yeah, but he's probably donating. A lot. He's probably donating his records and yeah. artifacts and things like that. He that's did. terrific. Yeah. Oh, I put a in the in the chat here. I put a link to the Agent Orange newsletter that the VA publishes, and it looks like they publish it once a year, maybe more frequently than that. But I put a link to it to the latest one that I could find. Um, Brian, if you want to, I'm gonna if you want to unmute. There we go. Sorry. There we go. I hate to monopolize things, but uh, since we didn't get into the drawing. We we're curious what roughly are the costs for best services to do the research? That's a good question. They're at her website, racialresearch.com, which okay. I have put in the chat. But let let me ask Beth. Let me let me look at your at your um services here and so we can get some pricing because that is a good and I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, here we go. Uh, I've got to let somebody in first. Pat Hughes from Texas. Got to let him in. Um, all right. This is Beth's website. Let's go to services. And. Or you can go to the research patch pa packages tab too, because that's. Um... Okay. Okay. Let's, let's look at this first. This is consultation, 30 minutes on Zoom or over the phone, uh, free consultation. That's nice of you, Beth. And that I think I would imagine, Beth, that in that consultation, you would be telling people kind of here's if you just want to do it yourself, you know, here's what you do. Or this is probably what you're going to be wanting. You know, this is probably where you should go, what you should do. And then um, it looks like I'm not putting I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but a two hour coaching and consultation session for seventy five dollars would be a much more intense kind of step by step research plan that you would present, create with somebody over a two hour session. Right. Okay. And that's people that didn't know me know that I would probably almost definitely spend more than time. <laughs> I don't know sure. how to stop. Start yeah, you're, a, you're, <laughs> a, you're a nut. That's for sure. Um, yeah. And I have to say that, you know, this is really a labor of love for, for Beth. I mean, for not only does she do, you know, she's models herself after Nancy Drew, but um, also she's just so embedded in the veterans community and so, so much a part of it. She knows that this is such valuable information to so many people. Um, and then for an in-depth research record report, this is where, you know, you go out and, and you, you do the research and you come back with everything that you could find uh, 175 bucks, and you cover all the processing and record speed. They're speaking. talking to 75. So, uh, I don't, is that any more to say about the in-depth research record report? No, and that's the fee that you'll find on the um, the tab for the next upcoming trip to St. Louis. That's that's the fee yeah. for yes. that. And I would, I think you and I discussed, Todd. I would obviously, I would do a consultation with somebody before. I would yes. um, go there um, yes. with that information. I would be, I, I would get their, their veterans information. And then I reach out to the national archives. I want to make sure that it's something that can be done um, before yeah. I go and charge anybody money for something. Yeah. You don't want to come back empty handed. And if you know that you are going to come back empty handed, you're not going to take the job. Um, Correct. So I'm going to put the link to this page that kind of details all you would do for the $175 um, right here in the chat. Uh, I, Brian, I think that should answer your question. Um, let me look in the chat now. I haven't had a chance to go through the chat, but I do want to invite people if they have a question or a comment, a story to share, uh, please do feel free to raise your hand. Here we go, Al. Oh. Yeah, Beth, I'm curious if you ever use this resource. I did, and it helped me. Um, make a long story short, in Vietnam, uh, one of the guys in my platoon was killed. I knew his hometown in Ohio. That's all I knew. When I got home, I thought it would be maybe comforting to reach out to the parents who I have always told want to know about their son or daughter when they were killed or in their service. So I didn't know how to get to him. I went to the Vietnam Wall. And at the Vietnam Wall, they have huge books 
and they have information about each name on the wall. And where, where it helped me was the hometown newspaper. Because once I found out from the date he was killed to the hometown newspaper, in the obituary was a ton of information. And I was able to track down the mother and father and the phone number. And I actually ended up calling them. And they said, please come out and see us. And so, again, for somebody who was in Vietnam, if they lost their life, the obituaries can be a wealth of information. I don't know if Beth has ever used that. And, and Al, actually, when I was looking up your friend, Michael, the first thing I did was, now you can access all of the information from the wall on their website. There's also an app, actually. Um, but so the first place I looked to make sure that Michael came home was was their website. Um, actually, I have the app on my phone. I looked on there. And I always use newspapers. Uh, dot com because I, I you can find so much information on there not all the time but obituaries are almost always on there that's a great I resource wanna, i want to let people know that i just did upload a big 81 megabyte uh pdf that beth has put together of this presentation with a lot more detail and a lot more links right here so please do it's in the chat here on the zoom side please do uh, open it and download it if you'd like Peg Dibel, how are you? Good to see you. Two weeks in a row. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, somehow or other, I uh, have ended up doing quite a few of these for folks who walk in the library at MAPS because I, you know, I'm a researcher there, um, and um, all this information I've gotten. Lots of great ideas from Beth. I just keep writing notes and writing notes. But uh, I thought I would add a few places that um, resources that I go to uh, when I'm looking. And the gentleman who was just talking about the obituary, um, you know, I, I end up using quite a few uh, websites, which I'm sure Beth does also. Uh, Find a Grave is, you know, it's a free one. All you have to do is just sign up for it. Um, Fold3.com is actually... Uh, compilation of military records um, and sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't but there is a charge to that uh, ancestry.com newspapers.com what I have found in newspapers.com and that makes it so valuable is that many times um, the you know if if a soldier or sailor came home on leave it would get reported in the newspaper or if he or she, or if he was in a particular battle, you know, it would get reported in the newspaper. If, you know, somebody jumped in Normandy with the 82nd, it gets reported in the newspaper. So um, that is, that's a really good resource that I have used a lot. Um, and then also, um, in Ohio, and I don't know about other states, uh, I've only had to chase down um, a, a, a father, a, a grandfather and a father in Pennsylvania, and I got kind of lucky with doing that. But most of the people that I do are from Ohio, obviously. Um, but in Ohio, we have uh, just, just in our library, but also in most genealogy libraries, the High Genealogical Society has a huge library. Um, but almost every place will have the Ohio Soldiers and Sailors roster from World War I, if you're looking at that. And it is incredibly invaluable because it gives everything about every single uh, service person for World War I from their birth date to uh, where they enlisted, um, what they served, what their rank was, you know, if, if um, uh, where they served, uh, if they served overseas, it will tell, you know, which department they served in. So it's very, very uh, valuable there. Um, often then when I'm able to finally get some type of unit information, then I will go to a number of different places. And one of the places that we have in our maps uh, research and reference room <laughs> is sort of where I spend my life, but it's a, it's a, um, a collection of uh, unit histories, ship histories, um, 
airbase histories that people have donated to us when they donate other books and other artifacts. And so if you happen to be lucky enough to have a regimental history um, or even a division history, it's a little tougher to whittle it down to where somebody was at a particular time. But, uh, you know, the smaller the size unit on those histories, the better off you are in being able to actually track where um, that individual um, service member may have been serving. Um, uh, and then from there, honestly, I just start Googling, and I'm sure Beth does this as well. Yeah. You know, if, if I know that somebody served in a particular unit, I just put it in the Google bar and see what comes up because it is absolutely amazing what is yeah. out there uh, from, you know, uh, different organizations, different reunions. Uh, there are some dot mill uh, websites mm -hmm. that are extremely good. Um, so anyway, that, those were just, you know, some of the, um, additional ones that, that I tend to use quite a bit. That's a Todd, I don't know if we'll have time, but if, if able, I wanted to use the, um, the one question that I put in the slideshow, I think it was, uh, Helen, um, as an example of, of what you can find via Google. <laughs> yes. And let me, let me get to that. I do want to thank our sponsors before you get to that, because that is a perfect example of how to use Google. <laughs> I, I'm a little embarrassed to say that's where I go first. You know, <laughs> put the name in quotations and then you, sometimes a bomb group association will have the full missing air crew report right there on the site. And that's all you need. Um, so yeah, that's a, it, for me, it's a good first, uh, first step. I, I want to thank Tobacco Free Adagio Health for sponsoring this program. They've been a sponsor for years now. Tobacco Free Adagio Health, uh, encourages people to quit smoking and tobacco use. They, uh, educate people about the hazards of tobacco use and they advocate for healthier places to live, work and play. They also help people quit smoking. And if you're interested in uh, quitting, or if you know somebody who might be interested in quitting, you could access their quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. That's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And you could also go and find out more at tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. UPMC for Life became a sponsor this year. We're very grateful to them. They'll be at many of our in-person events and uh, also are sponsoring this, this program tonight. Uh, they can help you make sense of Medicare, get the answers and information you need to know how to choose the Medicare Advantage plan that's right for you. They have uh, BBC, they have UPMC for Life plans designed by veterans and for veterans uh, that can save the money and help get more benefits. You can find out more about the plan options by going to upmchealthplan.com slash Medicare. That's UPM healthplan upmchealthplan.com slash Medicare. Medicare. I want to let people know you should have received the magazine. If you haven't, we got your address wrong or something went awry. I know that we get a big stack of returns um, and sometimes the addresses are correct. So we can't quite figure out why the magazines didn't end up to the proper destination. But if you didn't get one and you think you should, let me know. We'll make sure we get it in your hands. We've also been sending out boxes of 100, packages of 25, packages of 50 around the country for people to distribute. That's really how people find out about what we do through this free magazine. Uh, please let me know if you want a copy by emailing me at Todd, T-O-D-D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. Also, we have a survey. What do you think of this program? How could we have improved it? Um, and, and what kind of programs do you want to see uh, here online? You could go to our Survey Monkey survey and fill it out. It takes, on average, two and a half minutes to complete. I will put the link to that in the chat here tonight. All right. We have Irene. How are you, Irene? Good to see you all the way from Houston. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I have just a quick question. My father, of uh, for, for my my father was wounded in France. He was there only eight days. Um, a, he said that I I believe a captain picked him up and took him to an aid station, and then he was flown to England. Um, and I always thought it would be nice to contact that person's family to thank 
them um, or him if he's still alive. And I was wondering if uh, his records uh, were, he was in the army and his records were, we, we applied for them and his records were, we were told were burned and lost in the fire. But if they were to be reconstructed or if they had not been burned, would that information have been on his record? I've seen hospital admission cards um, from World War II. I've never seen anything about how the person ended up in the hospital. Um, okay. I would think that just in the midst of, of a war that I, I don't know, you know, how that would, the morning reports detail who was dropped from the rolls, which is like, you know, everybody that's there, anybody that goes to the hospital or is missing um, is mentioned on the morning report, but they don't notate, you know, anything. I've never, I personally have never seen that, but um, it's maybe somebody else has, I have not seen that before. Yeah. And I can say Irene's, Irene's <laughs> father, Peter Hoisen, attended our events with your mother, Vicki, yes. two wonderful, wonderful, beautiful people that we miss a, a lot. They were some of our earliest, uh, earliest veterans to, at the Veterans Breakfast Club. Irene, um, we could probably find his hospital, sorry, my, my brain, Todd, his hospital admission card and, and his unit, and then perhaps look at what, <laughs> who the uh, commanding officers were. Um, I, I mean, there are ways, there are ways if you think outside the box now that I think about it. So feel free okay. to. <laughs> this is why, this is why Beth is so great. This is why she's so great. She exactly. Have, you, know, yeah. you know what? There might be a, re there might be a way. Um, yeah. Real. <laughs> Thank you very Nancy, much. Modern You're day welcome. Nancy Drew. Can I ask you a stupid question that betrays my ignorance, Beth? Sure. <laughs> what is a morning report? A morning report? Um, that is <laughs> I, at the company. So for instance, Raymond, I found his morning report from when he went missing, but he, when he was actually killed in action, um, the morning report was his company's report of their location, date, time, his actually just said the vicinity of Gussenberg, I think it was, but, um, and it, and it lists anybody that is missing, um, any notable changes, um, anybody that was removed from the roles due to hospitalization, missing in action, uh, any big changes in the company at the company level. Okay. And who, <laughs> who writes the morning report and do they write it in the morning? That part would be a veteran question. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly can't tell you, but I bet one of these people, fine people here would know the answer to that. I'm suspecting they do. Bill, are you the one who knows the answer? Uh, that's uh, you're exactly right. It's done in the morning. Uh, compiles all the soldiers in that unit. And uh, it's usually done by the first sergeant or his chief clerk. Thank you. Yes. And it's done every day. Every day. Oh, and it's quite the pain. Quite, I, I could imagine quite the pain. It is. It's, it's mm. crazy. It is crazy. Beth, what about Ancestry.com? Uh, what do you, you know, is that a place that somebody oh. should like go to immediately sign up and start researching? One thing that's awesome that's on ancestry.com right now for, for Pennsylvania, if you're researching a Pennsylvania World War II veteran, again, like I said, every state has, seems to have different FOIA regulations, what they've released. Um, but Pennsylvania has released these things that I've sent to a few of you that sent me questions, um, the veterans uh, compensation application. So the veterans compensation application that they filed sometimes five years after they came back, uh, there, there could be, I've seen unit information on there, but the most helpful thing other than where they lived, they show where they lived when they went in the service. They also put, if they, you know, whenever they were gone overseas, it tells you the date that they left the U.S. and the date that they came back, which can be really helpful on all kinds of levels uh, for, you know, knowing when, okay, so Uncle Bob served in the 94th Infantry Division. Well, now we know when he went um, because everybody went in at different times. So it, it's, there's a lot of information on there that can be really helpful. That's, that's a huge, and of course, Ancestry.com, I don't know if you guys know, owns Fold3. So of course, so that people like me have to have 9 million memberships, 
You can get some military stuff on Ancestry.com, like Navy muster rolls, and then you can get other things on Fold 3, like there are some unit records, so you have to kind of use both of them together. <laughs> This is so great. We have a bunch of questions about a, a kind of tranche of questions here. Jim Roberts asks, what about Spanish American war veterans? Um, uh, Karen asks about, you know, I, and I think you answered it here in the chat, uh, American revolutionary and civil war records. Do you, you know, where are those? Can you do those? That, that kind of research. Beth Feather asks, how far back do you go looking for records? So what if I said, like, I had an ancestor, I think, fought in the civil war. Would you be willing and able to kind of take that on? So the Civil War um, files, I don't know that we can actually physically access them. So I have I have the pension file from a Civil War ancestor, my mom's uh, great grandfather. And that came to me in the, and it's more expensive than an OMPF. I think it was like one hundred and twenty dollars or something. But, um, you know, I had ordered that from the National Archives one. That's the one in DC, right by the National Mall, the one that you see on TV. It's real pretty. Um, so anything Civil War and before is located in that building. And I am not sure because I have not done, I have not gone there physically. I don't know that they let you actually physically touch some of those records. Um, some of them are so fragile that only the archivists are able to, you know, touch those records. And I imagine there has to be a digitization project that's many years in the making. There right? are a lot of pension files for Civil War um, on NARA's website. On the National Archives website, they are starting to digitize Civil War pension files. So there there are quite a few on there. Um, not everybody, obviously, but they are starting to, to digitize those. Okay. Now we're trying to, this is called, this game is called Stump Beth. Um, what about Spanish-American War records? You sound like my I, my uncle Jack, who's a Vietnam veteran. He really wanted to know if anybody in our family served in that war. Um, unfortunately, he didn't have ancestors here at that time. But um, Spanish American War is is also you, you can find some stuff on on the National Archives website. I believe that's also probably held at, at National Archives One. Um, there are pension file index cards for the Spanish American War on NARA's website on Ancestry.com. You can find the pension index card and that will give you the information to actually fi find their pension file darn it beth we wanted to stump you uh ed cottrell how are you ed hi ed. Uh, i have a question for beth uh is it possible to retrieve all the missions that i flew my log book was destroyed and i have no record of the missions that i flew during World War II. Is it possible through you to get those records? Sir, it would be an honor. The next time I go to St. Louis, it would be an absolute honor to pull your, uh, did did they have the uh, independent flight records? Did they keep those for you? Do you know? I mean, I know they have them for bomber crews. I would think they had them for, for fighter pilots as well, but I'm they have sure those in St. Louis. Uh, I had my logbook, but it was destroyed. So I have no record of only just what I remember. I would I would be very happy to get those for you when I when I go to St. Louis next time. I, I will email you with my uh email Service and my name and and the fighter group that I was with and so forth. I'll send Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So do you think those records exist with the fighter group? I'm Are sure they, I, I'm yeah, sure they it, do. Okay. I know I know even the bomber groups, they have those in St. Louis. I was always told that they only created them for the the pilots, for any of the officers. Um, but I do have flight records from my grandpa, and he was not an officer, he was a sergeant. And my uncle Gene was a master sergeant, um, and I have them for him. So I, I bet that they would have them for Ed. Oh man, this is so cool. That Thank would be you great. So much. <laughs> Thank you, Ed, for 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 giving uh, Beth that opportunity to do that research. Kevin Callahan, how are you? Good. I uh, just wanted to mention to Ed uh, that I knew a Czechoslovakian researcher who flew to Washington, D.C., and he was actually even able to get the mission debriefings, you know, and they did interrogation and they wrote it all up for yeah. each mission, which, you know, gives you all the people that were on the airplane, et cetera, et cetera. So Washington, D.C., I think, requires more that you show up in person to get 
that level of uh, information, but it, it, it would exist. I also wanted to comment that my dad it kind of explained this thing about why do you go to the real estate people? And uh, he was in World War II, and he said when he was uh, discharged, they told him, well, you're going to have this new thing, the GI Bill. And so you have to prove that you were honorably, honorably discharged. So go to the, the county recorder uh, where you live. Now, he got his VA benefits for land and for education in another state, but I would have to know where he sort of landed in terms of uh, when he got out of the service. Uh, but that's uh, that's available. Also, I've been finding um, it's very useful to put up just a web page uh, about people that you served with, crew members, because there's other people out there looking and searching if they can find a web page uh, about that, you'll connect with the whole families uh, of the, the crews and so forth. And I, I won't bore you with some of my stories, but some of them were amazing uh, where I put up some information and then people were researching and they explained what happened during World War II to a family who had been wondering about it ever since it happened. And that was because they could contact the other crew member. Uh, so. Anyway, that's all I had. That is wonderful information. And uh, Kevin, and how about that? That totally makes sense about the real estate, the, you know, the separation records and the uh, and being in the real estate office for the GI Bill. That makes sense. I think you solved a little mystery. Helen, how are you? I'm great, Todd. How are you? I'm doing well. Hi, Helen. Thank you. Thank you so much for your commitment to our veterans and all the work that you do. You are an inspiration to me. Oh, you're welcome, Helen. Yeah. It was, and, it was... and, and Beth, you, you gave me more information in a minute than I was able to gain in weeks and months and years. So I thank you for your efforts in looking up my, my father's records. You're welcome. And I have a whole bunch of stuff after this program. I'm going to send you a link to the, the Google file of all the stuff I found. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, my father was one of those people who he came back from the war and he just never spoke about it again. And, you know, little bits and pieces that I knew, but he never kept any of that information. Like he didn't keep his records. He didn't. He, they just never talked about it again. And um, the only thing I really have of my father is that he was in the Tiger, Tiger Tank Battalion, 817th Company A, and that he remained after the war to guard the German prisoners of war. And uh, but that really, I don't know much anything else, but. You sent me links to really what was just astounding that what his battalion really accomplished in the war. And I, it just gave me a whole new picture of my dad. And I was so grateful for that. I, I really was. You're welcome. It's an honor. Yeah. It's so and, beautiful, Helen. Yeah. And, you know, and it just makes me want like to look more, to yeah. see, you know, really what, what else was he involved in? Because, you know, in so many ways, it just might explain a lot of who he was. And my dad was just, every time a flag went by, my dad stood up, put his hand on his heart. He salute. He was so 100% American and and I I just really got so much from him in terms of like this is the greatest country in the world and we need to do everything we can to protect it. And so I learned that from him from a very early age. And it just makes me want to learn more about what his battalion did and and what he accomplished in the war because i know he was injured he was severely injured but he remained with his battalion 
and after he was released from the hospital, continued with his battalion. So I would love to see his records. And so that just kind of instills me to like research more. Yeah, oh, he has great. a really cool history. <laughs> Yeah. I'm looking at the clock here. It's 8.30. Our program is over, but I'm going to get Steve Giordano to ask one last question here. Uh, Steve, you're joining us from Kane, PA. Kane, Pennsylvania. The proud home of the Haberberger family. My brother-in-law is Drew Haberberger. I'm looking at his house right now. He's right, right next door to me. Um, great people. Uh, great great people. people. And a great brewery also. Log, log yard? Log yard brewery? That's that's in my old pharmacy building. I don't know how they're involved in that, but uh, his relative uh, runs a very good trash collection business and is very uh, loyal to veterans. Very, very, uh, very fair, good, well-run, independent business. Very yeah. good. You put an interesting question here in the chat. How do you find ship log records? Beth, do you know offhand? Um. I think somebody actually answered that form that said that there's a lot, lot of stuff in the National Archives, but I, I found a lot of uh, Navy stuff on Ancestry and Fold 3. They have uh, all the, all the what do they call, muster rolls. Um, so if, if your person too. was in the Navy, you'll you'll see them, you know, on, on every one of those. And then at the end of it, it shows you if there are changes. Um, it shows you if there are changes, it shows you if they went AWOL, it shows you all kinds of different things at the end, but. but ahead, muster rolls, ship muster rolls are different from ship logs, correct? One second, I'm trying to see if I have a picture of the logs. I'm going to follow up, Beth, and thank you again, Todd, also for everything you do. I can, I I'm, I'm a walking advertisement for you. I tell so many people how active. I just talked to my county representative today, and I'm going to follow up with him. I just tell everybody, and uh, I've never seen an organization that's as an, as active and different programs like you have. And thank you, Beth, too. I will contact you on your website too, and not looking for, and I can, for nothing. But and I, I can send you a link because. The National Archives does have ship logs, submarine deck logs. It has all kinds of stuff for the Navy. So I can I can point you in the right direction. Just email me. <laughs> I will. I'll, I'll go to your website. Thank you again, Todd. Thank and you, Steve. great to see all fellow veterans and people interested. How oh, great. What a wonderful evening. This went so fast. Jim McStay, you. you won the raffle. I hope you know that. You were one of the th all right. All right. One of the three winners. And I'll be contacting you and putting you in touch with Beth. This is That's such a, this is such a wonderful evening, Beth. Thank you so much for joining us. I have a feeling I'm going to be uh, asking you to come on again for a follow up. Maybe this should be something that we do fairly regularly because there are going to be more people with more questions, and um, and would love to hear kind of uh, updates on uh, what new information you found for people. So, thank you so much, Beth. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And those of you that I emailed with and I have information for, I'll follow up and send you uh, links to it all. All right. So those of you who are in Western PA, I might see you at our Beaver Breakfast on Wednesday morning. And if not, hopefully I'll see you Thursday night for our Greatest Generation Live with Les Schrank. Take care, everybody. Happy April Fool's Day. Don't, uh, don't be fooled. All right. Take care.